In our last episode, Jacob's groundbreaking experiments pushed the boundaries of possibility, rewriting history, and challenging the very fabric of memory projection. Now, as we delve deeper into his ever-expanding theories, Jacob embarks on a journey of discovery that unlocks new mysteries and unravels age-old secrets. Join us for another thrilling installment of the Actuality Podcast. Detective Jensen opened the door, and wasn't at all surprised to see his partner typing away on his computer. His partner looked up in acknowledgement, and they exchanged a simple greeting before Jensen said a word. Hey, check this out. Remember that kid from the university we brought in a few weeks ago? Yeah, Olsen, right? What about him? I ran the serial numbers on the bills he tried to deposit, and guess what? We got a hit. From Interpol. Interpol? Like the international police? Are you sure? Positive. I checked into it a bit more and it gets even weirder. Turns out these bills came from the Antwerp World Exchange Center. You know, the one in Belgium. That place was hit over 25 years ago. One of the biggest heists in the world. Crazy, right? So the kid wasn't involved in the actual robbery for sure, but that 50 grand leaves a whole lot of unanswered questions. Jensen said, dropping the report down on his partner's desk. He lifted it up and flipped through the pages, some of them handwritten notes by Jensen, others printed pages from the database. He skimmed through as much information as he could, and by the time he was finished, he was baffled. First question is, how in the world did that kid get that cash? Doesn't make any sense. I can't even imagine what the ending to this story is, but he's got my attention for sure. Once he opened his eyes inside the memory, it was more vivid than any of the others he'd been inside before. He wasn't sure if he had done something wrong or if everything looking so different was just a product of his young mind. This was the earliest memory he'd accessed, his preschool years. Everything around him was colorful. Even the gray of the cement and the fence around the schoolyard looked vibrant and lively. He stood outside of the schoolyard, just beyond the fence that barred any outsiders from accessing the expanse of grassy fields and cemented playgrounds. He rested his hands on the metal wires of the fence, peeking through the gaps at the children inside. He wasn't quite sure where he had spotted the woman he assumed to be his mother in this memory, so after an unsuccessful scan of the yard, he began searching for his younger self. After a while, Jacob caught sight of a child whom he assumed to be himself. When the children came closer, it wasn't hard to pick him out from the others. He wasn't sure whether that was because he just knew or because something seemed off about the boy in comparison to the rest. The children were currently at play, and to Jacob it looked like they were playing some preschool version of Foursquare. He waited in line, watching the other children play until the ball bounced off at a bad angle and was sent flying into the field beyond the courtyard. The child looked off into the distance away from Jacob, and he remembered that he had been unanimously voted to retrieve the ball. He quickly ran off to get the ball for the other children, but before reaching the ball, he stopped, staring off into the distance once more. In an attempt to see what his younger self was looking at, Jacob moved along the fence until he got a good view of the other side of the fence adjacent to him. There she was. The woman staring into the yard and watching the children at play was the one he recalled. He looked back and forth between her and the younger Jacob, trying to remember what he was thinking when he saw her from that point of view. For some reason, he just thought that he could only think of her blue eyes, that he couldn't see her from this angle. But her sandy brown hair made her stand out as someone he vaguely remembered. Jacob backed away from the fence to get a better view of the woman and watched her as she flipped and adjusted her hair in the distance, exposing a small tattoo on her wrist. She looked around briefly before putting her gloves on and walking in the opposite direction of the school. Jacob watched her until she turned a corner. Just like that, she was gone before he could decide whether he'd follow her or not. Jacob was alone in his dorm when he heard a knock on the door. He stood up and walked to the door, stifling a yawn as he unlocked it. He grinned when he saw who it was. Hey, Jacob said once he opened the door for Zoe to come inside, but blocking her path to prompt a kiss before allowing her to gain access. They took a seat on his couch as she reclined against him. So, how do you feel? You didn't say much after we left the lab last night. You saw her, right? Well, sort of. I mean... I think I saw her, but I didn't approach her. I was about to go talk to her and she left, and it didn't seem right to follow her. I guess that makes sense. 
So what was the hunch you were talking about last night? Well, I spoke to my foster parents during the winter break. They gave me the impression that my mother didn't really die giving birth. What? I'm sure they had their reasons for ever telling me that in the first place, he said. But from the look on her face, he could tell she didn't seem too convinced. After a few minutes of silence, he spoke again. By the way, I don't think we should talk to anyone about this. You know what I mean? Even Dean? I'm sure we could get into some big trouble if anyone finds out we're in the lab after hours. Wouldn't want you to lose your key. You're right about that. Promise you won't tell anyone? Jacob, I promise. Zoe looked into his eyes for a couple of seconds before looking away and getting up from the couch. Okay, I gotta go. I just wanted to see how things went. She said on her way to the door. Jacob hopped up and joined her at the door, opening it for her. I'm glad you did, he said as she left. After she had disappeared down the corridor, he stepped back inside his dorm and locked the door, checking the time before plopping back down on the couch. He picked up his cell phone and dialed. He was about to hang up when on the last ring there was an answer. Hey, you busy? I've got a minute. Everything okay? It's about what we talked about over break. Just one more question, I promise. Did she have a tattoo? Hmm. Now that you mention it, I think she did, actually. I believe it was on her wrist. Do you remember what it looked like? It was strange. I remember asking her about it because I thought it was so unusual. To me, it just looked like a black circle. Well, because that's what it was. She mentioned something about it symbolizing the eclipse and that she and her husband had matching ones. He asked her to get it, I think. I thought the sentiment was sweet. Jacob's heart raced as his mother described the tattoo he had seen on the woman at the park. Thanks, Mom. I'll call you later, he said, hanging up with excitement. The door to Professor Melbourne's office was partially open when Jacob approached, and he could hear the tapping of the professor's typing coming from within. He opened the door when he got closer and stood in the doorway for a second, the professor not having noticed his presence. Professor Melbourne, got a minute? Professor Melbourne looked up from his computer spotted Jacob and smiled. Of course, of course. What is it? Professor Melbourne asked, pushing his laptop to the side and reaching for his cup of coffee. He screwed it up closer to the desk as Jacob neared, resting his elbows on the wood while he took a sip of his hot drink. About the research project, uh, are there any theories that describe the possible effects on a person's personality by changing events in the past? Like, any dangerous side effects? Well, as you know, this research is almost completely theory if you can even call it that, uh, very little content in the area of FTL time travel has yet to be proven or even attempted. As it is, no one has successfully completed the process even once. So much of that information remains unknown to us. Our research group has thus far made more progress than I have ever expected us to. And with you, we have the chance to go even further. Possibly you may be able to answer your own questions. He was interrupted by a knock, not on the door, but on the door frame. Jacob turned to see that it was someone he couldn't recognize and looked back to the professor. When he did, he was confused by the look of pure disbelief displayed on the professor's face. Jacob took another look at the man in the doorway. He still didn't look familiar. It was true. Jacob, this is my brother, Alex. Hello, Victor. What did you do? How are you here? After all this time, those are your first words to me? I've just come to pay you a visit. I spoke to the men's correctional facility after you sent me your letter, but they stated that they had no record of your admittance, that you had never been housed there as a prisoner. I was there in the courtroom, a full-grown man with understanding. I know what I heard. I know what I saw. I sat with Papa in the court. I watched them take you away. Forty years. Forty years for that diamond heist. You broke Mama's heart. And for what? To say that you pulled off the biggest theft in the world? Jacob listened to Milburn's explanation, and after he finished speaking, Jacob realized what happened. Alex looked at Milburn with an odd expression, a mixture of confusion and surprise. What in the world are you talking about? And aren't you going to at least introduce me to your friend here? Jacob, right? All of the color drained from Jacob's face as the professor and his brother stared at him. Professor Melbourne ignored his inquiry of Jacob's identity. What did you do? Before Alex could respond, 
Jacob sucked at a loud breath, causing both the professor and Alex to turn to him. Jacob, are you all right? You look very pale. Yeah, uh, I'm just not feeling so great. I'm going to take off. Thanks for the information, though, Professor. Jacob said as he made his way out the door. Alex's eyes were trained on him as he moved out of sight. Darkness, and the beat like the rhythm of a drum. It would happen at random, but each time it did, Jacob waited for the voice. The soothing sound of the voice and the familiar melody of the song with words he couldn't understand. He felt himself floating as the voice massaged him. Like always, as he felt at his calmest, it was gone. Jacob woke to the soft ringing of his cell phone. He found the vibrating device buried beneath his blankets, and upon his inspection, he found that it was Dean calling. I called you like 20 times last night. Where were you, dude? I, uh, I was with Zoe last night. It was only a partial lie. But if Dean decided to check up on him, it would be easy to figure out he lied. They were both quiet for a moment before Dean decided to respond. You two sure have been spending a lot of time together lately. You up to hanging out tonight? I've actually already got plans with Zoe. Jacob stopped when he heard Dean scoff. He supposed that now he'd consider Dean officially angry. I should have known. Whatever. Jacob stared at the call screen in confusion, wondering what Dean was so upset about. Dean watched Zoe and Jacob talk to each other in the distance, the two of them hanging out on a nearby picnic bench. He felt the pang of sadness when they laughed together and seemed happy without him. Dean felt jealous of their interactions, of how since they'd gotten together, neither of them had really been spending much time with him. He got up flustered, annoyed, and somewhat angry, going to join them at the table. So, what do you guys do? I mean, you've been spending so much time together. What's so important that you guys can't take a night off? Seriously? Dean asked as he neared them. But the question was directed at Zoe. He stared at her angrily, as if it somehow was her fault. He stopped near them and pressed his hands into the edge of the table, leaning into it, as he waited for an answer that never came. I mean, two days in a row. You really can't seem to spend a moment apart. Zoe looked at Dean and frowned, but her gaze shifted to Jacob for a second. Jacob noticed that she seemed pretty uncomfortable with the prospect of an angry Dean. What are you even talking about? What's your problem? We haven't seen each other for more than half an hour outside of class in almost a week. Why are you acting like such a jerk? What's up with you? Jacob jumped in, trying to break Dean's focus on Zoe. Dean looked at him, his gaze angry at first, but Jacob saw it break into realization and hurt. He had picked up on the fact that Jacob lied to him about his whereabouts the previous night. Are you kidding me? You've stood me up so many times in the last two weeks, it's getting ridiculous. You've never even apologized once for anything. I keep pushing it aside and trying again, but I'm sick of it. I bought us tickets to go see the game. You didn't even tell me you were skipping out. Then the movies. I put off some girls that wanted to go out partying to hang out with you. Guess what? You stood me up that night too. I can't even count how many times you've skipped out on doing homework the other. But it doesn't matter. I've had enough, Dean shouted. His face was red, and with a quick look behind him, he could see that everyone in the area was staring at them. You've been lying to me this whole time. Ever since you've been dating Zoe, you've both been acting strange. He glared at both of them, but he implied that it was somehow Zoe's fault, which brought out Jacob's anger. He stood up and faced Dean, gritting his teeth. Just back off, Jacob shouted, pushing Dean away from the table. Zoe gasped as Dean steadied himself flailing backward and then stood straight up and looked at Jacob in disbelief. Wow, dude. Really? Wait, Dean, I didn't mean to- I'd just save it. Memory manufacturing is a simple concept that stems from the theory that information provided from a source that is deemed reliable by the recipient will more readily be accepted by the brain as actual fact even if the information is based on false elements. It's believed that persons with higher mental imagery abilities or a greater creativity are more susceptible to the misinformation effect. This is because of the possibility of their brains forming exceedingly detailed and vivid recollections based off of the implanted misleading information, therefore increasing the chances of their brain's susceptibility to assimilating the information into their pre-existing memories as real. For the purposes of memory projection, the theory is that all one need do is take information about a place, person, or event in history and spend a period of time concentrating on that information. 
If the information is planted thoroughly in the mind before they attempt a projection, they are potentially capable of creating a manufactured memory about that information and are able to access it as though they would any pre-existing memory. Dean tuned out the rest of the lecture and turned in his seat, watching as Jacob and Zoe laughed and worked together on some other aside. As class ended, Jacob and Zoe left the class quicker than Dean had hoped. He tried to catch up to them so he could speak to Jacob, but in the distance he saw him give Zoe a quick goodbye kiss and then leave without noticing him. Zoe walked off without seeing him either, but she didn't seem to be in such a hurry to get anywhere. He sighed and ran to catch up with Zoe, who was still in sight. He could hear her humming to herself as he approached. Zoe, wait up, Dean shouted when he got close, catching her attention. She turned to face him and stopped to wait for him, a bright smile covering her face. I haven't seen you much as of late. Yeah, I've been all over the place, he said. He felt somewhat awkward talking to Zoe, but was hoping to rebuild with her and Jacob. He wasn't sure if she was still his friend, even though they had known each other longer than Jacob had known either of them. I was wondering, is Jacob all right? We haven't spoken since the two of us fought. He hasn't returned my calls or anything. I just kind of miss the fact that we don't hang out. The three of us, I mean. Don't worry about it, Dean. It's just bad timing. I'm sure Jacob is fine. The both of us have had a lot to think about. You haven't noticed anything different about him? There's nothing to worry about. Anyway, I'll talk to you later. I need to go. It was good talking to you. She gave him a lopsided smile then jogged off. As Dean and Zoe spoke and parted ways, they had no idea that they were being watched in the distance. As they both separated and disappeared from sight, so too did their observer. It was just after midnight when Jacob left his dorm and headed to the lab. He took his time walking there, though it wasn't because he was looking to enjoy a leisurely stroll. It was that he couldn't shake the feeling of someone watching him. Even after several turns and detours, he couldn't shake the feeling. Jacob made it into the lab a bit later than he'd hoped because of the detours. Once he got inside, he rushed to set up the projection machine and neglected the double check that the dawn simulator was set. It wasn't, and he soon fell into a deep sleep. Jacob was sure that the woman he watched through the chain link fence was his mother. Not only did she fit the description he was given, but she looked intriguing and interesting. He watched her through the fence as he had the last time, remaining quiet and trying not to draw her attention. She looked off into the playground and watched the younger Jacob play. Then he saw her turn in his direction. His eyes focused on hers, meeting her gaze while she stared at him. It was the first time she had noticed him, but before he could do anything, she turned and began walking away. Jacob made the decision to follow her this time. He knew that following her would be the only way to learn more about her. He had waited all this time to meet his birth mother, and now it was finally happening, so he wanted to get as much out of it as he could. He waited for her to turn the corner at the end of the block, and when she vanished behind the buildings, he began following her. He waited at the corner and peeked around the building, watching as he walked down an empty street. From the look of it, she hadn't noticed him. Trying to act casual, he walked out onto the sidewalk and kept a normal pace behind her. Without any notice whatsoever, she turned and walked into a small diner. He hadn't thought of what to do if that happened, whether he should wait for her to come out or follow her inside. He hesitated for a moment, but decided to follow her instead of waiting. He walked up to the door several minutes later, trying not to appear as if he were following anyone. As the door opened, he gasped in pain when he felt his mother's fist meet his stomach. That definitely was not what he expected. Jacob groaned in pain and backed up to support himself against the door. He felt the mouth of a gun press into his gut, and he willingly followed the woman when she ordered him around the corner and into the alley beside the store. The gun was still pressed into him when she finally spoke. Who are you and why are you following me? She asked, making no attempt to sound nice. She was all business and the coldness he had seen in her eyes when she looked at him at the school rang clear and true in her voice. She held it all the same on her face when she spoke to him. Why are you following me? C -cl clarissa Jacob stuttered her name, but him knowing who she was seemed to aggravate her further. Jacob realized this when she pressed the gun harder into his flesh as a warning. You better start talking or you might as well consider yourself dead. Y you're a tattoo, Jacob said. Mentioning the tattoo seemed to anger her even more than mentioning her name. Exactly what Jacob didn't want to do. How do you know about that? She asked, sounding surprised but not in a good way. 
He wanted her to see him as less of a threat, but instead, she thought of him as a larger one. Jacob heard the gun cock and started to panic. Y you put Jacob up for adoption in Colorado, and, and you only put him up for adoption under the condition that you got to deliver him to the new family and get to approve them yourself. Jacob recited the facts, frantic, but Clarissa didn't seem as weary about him knowing that information. Wait, how do you know all of this? Do his foster parents know that I've been coming to see him? I'm a relative of the Alsons. I've just been visiting for a while. I saw you by the fence. I just thought you looked similar to the woman they described as his birth mother, that's all. Clarissa seemed to accept that explanation and slowly put away the guy. The Alsons haven't ever mentioned anything about you visiting. Clarissa took a step back from Jacob. <sighs> I need to leave. She didn't even say goodbye. Just looked at him for a long second and then ran off onto the street from the alley. Jacob watched her go. But once she was gone from sight, he moved to see where she'd gone. His first step was met with the wave of discoloration that meant he would soon wake up. Jacob opened his eyes, but the immediate lack of the bright light of the dawn simulator threw him into a panic. It hadn't woken him, as it hadn't even been on. He slid off the helmet and rushed to get his things, grabbing his cell phone to read the time while he gathered all of his belongings. It read 7.47 a.m., oh, no. over an hour longer than he intended to stay that night. He moved faster than ever, making sure the machine had no evidence of use and leaving the lab as quick as possible. He had dodged a bullet seeing that nobody came into the lab that morning because from what Jacob knew of the professor's habits, he and several other students were in and out of the lab all day starting at 7 a.m. Rushing out of the building, he was zipping up his backpack when he stopped, almost spilling his belongings You've everywhere. you be kidding me. Who he saw wasn't who he expected to see. It was the detectives who spoke to him about the money he had attempted to deposit at the bank. Hey, Olsen, where are you going? Or should I say, what you been up to? Been spending a lot of time locking yourself in that lab at night. Before you try to feed us some crazy story, we followed you, and we saw you go in there last night. Locking that door was the smartest thing you've done since then. If it's all the same to you, I've got to get ready for my next class. He decided that he didn't have to tell them anything. Worrying about it only made him look more suspicious, so he ignored their questions and walked past them without another word. The detective's gaze followed him, and one of them shouted after him. So, you gonna tell me where your dorm is, or are we gonna have to keep meeting like this? The detective's words received no response from Jacob. He pretended not to hear them. As soon as he knew he was out of their sight, he sprinted down the path in hopes of getting to his dorm before they thought to follow him there. Eh, no use following him now. If he's up to anything, we'll catch him soon enough. Jacob's world has been turned upside down as he grapples with the impossible, having met the mother that he never knew. But as he navigates this newfound connection, unexpected complications arise. How will Jacob's interactions with his birth mother unfold? And what will his sneaking around to see her do to his relationship with Dean? Tune in to the next episode of the Actuality Podcast to uncover the twists and turns of Jacob's ever-evolving journey.